And uh, can you join me and just say thanks to the praise team for leading us this morning? appreciate their service to the Lord and especially as the week progressed and I was getting messages the different parts of the praise team weren't going to be able to be here and at one point it was looking like Hunter wasn't going to be able to be here and I'm like we're going to be kind of in trouble <laughs> but then uh, things shifted and Hunter said hey I will be able to be there and we're thankful uh, to be able to have some live music and uh, you should be thankful that it's not me having to lead you this morning. And everybody said, amen. <laughs> all right. I got one amen to get going here. All right. We are in week three of our series, King of Kings, looking at the book of 1 Samuel, and it is a flyby through the book of 1 Samuel. And we're not spending a lot of time on this book, but there are some great things throughout the book of 1 Samuel that I believe God has for us. And so kind of flying by yet, dropping in and learning some great nuggets of wisdom and insight of what God has for us, what we can learn from Samuel's life. And today we're going to look at King Saul. Now King Saul, and we talk about the rise and fall of King Saul. You see, if you grab your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 8, and we're going to look at from chapter 8 to chapter 15 today. Did you guys bring a lunchbox with you? I mean, I, I, think we'll, I think we'll be able to do all right. We'll skip through things. And, but there are some very important things that we need to learn today as we look at chapters 8 through 15. If you pick it up in chapter 8, beginning with verse 1, I'm just going to kind of give you an overview of chapter 8, and then we'll jump in on chapter 9 for our reading today. But before we do that, would you join me in praying the prayer that Samuel learned to pray as a young man, probably a teenager, maybe about 12 years old even, where he was simply told to pray, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Would you join me in praying that this morning? Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And so, Father, that is hopefully the disposition of our heart this morning to say speak Lord we're listening we want to hear from you not not hear from me and so father I pray that the words of my mouth the meditation of my heart would be pleasing to you my rock and my redeemer and we pray this in and for your name amen so in chapter 8 verse 1 Samuel is in essence, the leader of Israel. He's working on behalf of the Lord. The Lord tells him what to do, and Samuel does it. The Lord tells him what to tell the Israelites, and he tells them what the Lord says. And things are going well. He serves as the judge over the nation of Israel. There's really a number of different positions that Samuel effectively is serving. He's serving as a judge, He's also, in many regards, serving as a priest. He's the go-between between the Lord and the nation of and the people of Israel. He's serving in a lot of different roles, but he's aging. And people come to him in chapter 8 and they say, Hey, Samuel, you're, you're getting up there. You're about done, <laughs> basically. And we've looked at things and we've evaluated things and we've come to the conclusion that your sons would be horrible leaders. That, this is the Wyatt translation, okay? The Cliff Notes version. Your, your sons would be horrible leaders. They're not men of God. They're, they're, they're terrible. They take bribes. They, they are not honoring the Lord whatsoever. And we have decided, as, as kind of the elders of Israel, we've decided that we want a king. And then they add in, it's not just because Samuel's sons are not obeying and walking in the ways of the Lord. It's really because they want to be like the other nations. The other nations have a king and we want to be like them. So Samuel takes what they've said and he is quite distraught. He's like, what is going on? Have I not led this nation very well? What? what? And he's, he's just really broken up about it. So he takes it to the Lord in prayer. And God says to, to Samuel, Samuel, they have not rejected you. They have rejected 
me as their king. Give them what they want. Give them a king. I will tell you who is going to be the king. But here's the deal. You need to give them some warnings. Tell them God's going to give you a king, but just with that, know that there are some things that will come along with that, like taxes and some other things. In essence, God tells Samuel, basically, you tell the Israelites, be careful what you ask for. You can go ahead and just turn to your neighbor and say, be careful what you ask for. Now, you turn to the other neighbor, the, the second one, your second favorite, and you tell them, be careful what you ask for. That's pretty good stuff right there. Be careful what you ask for. And you need to keep that in mind. But that's not even the lesson for the day. Here's the overview. The, the big idea, the real key lesson for today is this. Obedience is the key that unlocks what God, what God has for you. Obedience is the key that unlocks what God has for you. C.S. Lewis, some of you have probably heard of him. He said, obedience unlocks every door. And I don't know that obedience unlocks every door. And I, I, I really hate to disagree with C.S. Lewis. He's far more acclaimed than me and smarter than I ever thought of being. But I actually like what I came up with better than what he had. So I stuck with mine. Obedience is the key that unlocks what God has for you. Let's jump in to 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 8. Love for you to follow along, not just on the screen behind me here, but if you have your Bible, follow along there, or a smartphone or a tablet that you have the Bible app on, or a way to access the Bible, or you can grab one of the KDBC Bibles there in front of you. I really love for you to be able to follow along, especially because not everything that I'm going to mention or reference today from chapters 8 through 15 will be on the screen behind me, Okay. But I want you to be able to follow along and say, yep, that's, that's what's going on. That's the gist of what, what's happening or what's being said. Or if there's something that I get off on and it's, it's wrong, you can, you can say, hey, wait a minute. That's not what the Bible says. All right? Deal? So here we go. Chapter 9, verse 3. Now the donkeys belonging to Saul's father, Kish, were lost. And Kish said to his son, Saul, take one of the servants with you and go and look for the donkeys. So sure enough, Saul get his, gets a servant and they go and they look for donkeys. And they go and they look for donkeys. And they look and they look. And the scriptures tell us that they go through five different towns or regions looking for the donkeys. And they're about ready to give up and just go home and say, we can't find them. We don't know what to do, but... We've got to go back. This is a waste of time. And the servant says, you know what? I've heard of, there's this, a man named Samuel, a man of the Lord. He's nearby. Let's find him and ask him. Maybe he can help us find the donkeys. And so they decide, yep, that sounds like a great idea. We've got nothing to lose. Let's go see Samuel and see what Samuel has to say. Verse 14, they went up to the town and as they were entering it, there was Samuel coming toward them on his way up to the high place. Now the day before Saul came, hold this kind of in the back of your mind. The day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed this to Samuel. About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him ruler over my people Israel. The word anoint basically means to bless or to consecrate. You're going to set him aside. We're going to give him a special honor. You're going to anoint him. He's going to be the ruler. He's going to be the king. I'm still king of kings, but he's going to be the king over the nation of Israel. They asked for a king. I'm going to give them a king. And it's going to be this man that comes to you. And there's something in this that I think is important for us to pick up. Obedience in the blah leads to blessing. Obedience in the blah leads to blessing. How many of you ever chased donkeys? And some of you just went all over the place with that, right? Some of you are like, 
Uh, my, if you're talking about my kids, yeah, I tried to chase them down. Okay, we haven't chased donkeys literally. I, I've chased chickens. Not a lot of fun. Never chased donkeys, but I've, so I kind of thought through it and just tried, well, like, what would that be like? And especially looking at scripture, and, and like, it kind of sounds boring to me. I mean, in some ways. Like, eh, that's, not, that's not really what it's all about. That just seems kind of like down beneath me. You're down, but that's not, that's not the way I want to spend my life. How many of you want to spend your life chasing donkeys? That doesn't, that, yeah, those kid cars like count me out on that one. No, no, thank you. I've got higher aspirations than that, okay? I, I think of chasing donkeys, and I, I think that that's pretty burdensome. That's, a, if you look at their, if you look at their, uh, the region of where they're at, it's, it's quite hilly, uh, like hills and valleys, and they're going, there's a lot of walking going on, and that sounds like a lot of work. It's also barren kind of work. I mean, especially if you look at this, they, they go to one place. Can you, can you just kind of picture with me? Saul and his servant, they go through one village. Hey, have you seen my daddy's donkeys? Hey, have you seen my daddy's, like, day after day, they're having this, have you seen my daddy's donkeys? Nope, I haven't seen them. Or, yeah, I saw them, I think they went that way, and they go this way, and they, hey, have you seen my daddy's donkeys? Nope, I haven't seen them. Or, yep, we saw them, but they went that way. And I'm like, nothing, nothing, nothing. How many of you have done things and got nothing in return? Like, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, but it's getting me nowhere. Can I just tell you this morning, obedience in the law leads to blessing. Jesus says, and it's recorded in Matthew chapter 25, 21, he tells this parable about talents. And basically about being obedient, being faithful with the little. Or even you might call it the blah. Like this is all I got. And how if we're faithful with the little, we will be given more. It leads to the blessing. Obedience in the blah leads to the blessing. Is it possible that God even caused those donkeys to go missing? I think it's possible that God just gave him a little kick or whatever. I don't know how he did it. They're like, hey, you guys go for a little run. Here you go. Have fun. I'm going to use you to get my guy Saul where he needs to be so that I can lead him and get him onto the throne of Israel. I, I think we oftentimes miss... God appointments. Because it's in the mundane, in the normal, in the blah of life. And we're thinking that God only shows up or God only works in those special uh, moments, right? In those, those like just being from heaven instead of chasing donkeys and having a divine appointment. Because you did catch this, right? That the day before the Lord said to Samuel, Tomorrow I will bring you a man, anoint him as the ruler over this nation. Like the day before, like so God knew what was going on. God knew exactly where the donkeys were and where they weren't. God knew exactly where, where Samuel would be on the next day. And that Samuel and Saul, who God had anointed and had chosen to be the, the king, the first king of Israel, that they would have a divine appointment so Samuel could anoint Saul and tell Saul God's calling on his life. I just want to encourage you today. Don't stop chasing donkeys. Be obedient in the blah in those mundane, in those little things, in those things that seem to be burdensome. They're hard. It's not a lot of fun. There's not a lot of great rewards in it. There's not a lot of recognition in it. You don't get awards for being the donkey chaser. But you get blessing. You get blessing when you're, when you're faithful, when you're obedient. 
Saul's dad said, go, go, go look after these donkeys. Go chase after these donkeys. And Saul did it. And God met Saul in the midst of that. Let's go back to our text. So S Saul is anointed king. And, and God gives... God gives his approval of that, makes it clear to the people that, that Saul is his man. And you can see that, chapter 8, chapter 9. We're going to pick it up, but some scoundrels said, how can this fellow save us? So he's anointed king, and they say, how can this fellow save us? They despised him and brought him no gifts. There's a lot of haterade going on. I mean, they just, they, how many of you know that when things go well, it doesn't mean everybody's going to like you. You know that, right? Like when, when God blesses, when you maybe are recognized, maybe when you get a promotion and something happens, not everybody's going to like it. People get jealous or whatever the case is. I love how Saul responds though. He just, he just kept silent. It's like he's thinking haters are going to hate. It doesn't affect me. He just kind of brushes it off. There's something great to learn here from, from Saul and the, the rise of King Saul. Saul is getting it right. We even see that early on, just after he's been anointed king, there's, there's an area of Israelites, a group of Israelites that are being attacked. And... They're about to be taken over and basically made slaves. And they're going to have to poke out one of their eyes to say, Hey, yep, we belong to them. But at the last hour, Saul leads a, a military attack. And they conquer the enemy and they save the day. Saul's the hero and there's a group that come to Saul and they say, Hey, where are those guys? Those scoundrels that wanted to say, you know, they were talking down on you and all that. Where are they? Let's bring them out and kill them. Like, That's kind of like our, our victory thing. We're going to celebrate by killing some of our own people that didn't vote for you. That didn't like you. That don't like you. Didn't believe in you. Let's kill them. And Saul gives this wonderful, wonderful response. He says, No one shall be put to death today, for this day the Lord has rescued Israel. I mean, Saul is doing awesome. He's leading the troops. He's a valiant warrior. And yet he's also humble and obedient. Sin troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And Saul's men began to scatter. So we get what's going on here. Samuel says, hey, wait seven days. I'll come. I'll make the offering. We'll, we'll take care of things. And then you guys can go into battle. There, that's the deal. This is what God's plan is. Like, it's seven days, we're in the eleventh hour of the, of the seven days, and the, the guys are starting to scatter. They're starting to go, wait a minute, this isn't for us, this isn't looking good, we're out of here. So he said, verse 9, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived. Ever been caught in the middle of something that you weren't supposed to be doing. Mom and dad said, don't do this. They leave and you're doing something and they come back and you're like, oh man, you busted. The boss, <laughs> aka your spouse. No. <laughs> Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived and Saul went to greet him. What have you done? I love the introduction. What have you done? Asked Samuel. Saul replied, When I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, uh-oh, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt, again, uh-oh, compelled to offer the burnt offering. Bad things happen when we just rely on our thoughts and our feelings. Am I preaching to this morning? 
Are you with me this morning? Bad things happen when we just rely on our own thoughts and our feelings. He felt compelled to go ahead and offer the burnt offerings. Verse 13. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. There was a blessing on the other side of the door. The key was in your hand and you dropped it. All you had to do was be obedient. To, to stay with it. You, you had been obedient up to a point. And then you bailed. And you decided, I can't wait on God's timing anymore. Can't help but wonder how many of us have done that in our own lives. We were obedient up to a point. Like, okay, Lord, this is as long as I can go. I can't stand it anymore. I've got to. Or I think that. Or I feel like. And instead of telling our thoughts or our feelings to check themselves at the door and be obedient to the Lord, we, we listen to those thoughts. We act on those feelings because we become impatient. And so I think Saul would tell us this morning, don't let impatience lead to disobedience. Don't let impatience lead to disobedience. Saul had a problem with this. He waited, but he didn't wait long enough. He became impatient. What happens when you become impatient? We do things we shouldn't do, right? We, when, when you're impatient, when you're an impatient driver, what happens? You take risks that you normally wouldn't take. I've been back behind this truck for forever. I've got to get around him. And then you end up cutting it way closer than you should have because you, be, you become impatient. What happens when we become impatient when it comes to obeying the Lord? We start thinking, well, I, I you know, I waited, I waited quite a while and we'll start to justify things. Well, God should have done this earlier. Or God should have done that. Or whatever, whatever the case would be. And we start to justify things. Don't let impatience lead to disobedience. And we see that as we march on, Saul has a problem with this. Again, they're about to go into battle. And, and Saul tells the priest Ahijah to come and, and bring the ephod. And we're going to like seek the Lord's blessing. And we're going to seek God's direction. So Saul said to Ahijah, bring the ephod. While Saul was talking to the priest, the tumult in the Philistine camp increased more and more. And so, oh no, well, things are really starting to bubble over. So what does he do? So Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. Now for us, we, we're like, what, what does that mean? Withdraw your hand. I love how the New Living Translation puts this. It says that Saul says to, to Ahijah, never mind. I, again, I wonder how many of us, we end up saying to the Lord, never mind. It's like we're going to ask the Lord's direction. We're going to ask for his blessing. We're going to ask for his help. And then it's like, oh, oh never mind. I'll just figure it out myself. I don't have time for God is basically what Saul is saying here. And so he leads the troops. He says, okay, let's go into battle. We're going ahead because we've got to get this thing going. And he is so impatient and he is so determined that he gives a command. He gives this decree. Anybody that eats, any soldier that eats before the victory is complete will surely be put to death. You eat, you die. If you don't wait, which is kind of strange, 
Here we go, Saul, Mr. Impatient, asking for other people to be patient. If you eat before we win, before the victory's over, it's secured, you will die. The thing is, his own Saul, Jonathan, didn't hear the command. As you follow along in scripture, Jonathan was already out of battle. He, he missed the team huddle. So he didn't hear what his dad had to say. And he's out in battle and he's hungry. He's been fighting. He's been going at it. And he sees some wild honey and is like, hey, I need something for strength. So he takes a little scoop of honey, takes it, and the scripture says like his eyes kind of came alive like... You, he ever ate maybe a Snickers or you, whatever it is and kind of just like gives you a little bit of boost and like, hey, now I can go. And, and Jonathan gets that. There's another soldier that sees him take a little bite of the, the honey and he says, hey, Jonathan, wait. Well, like, it was too late, but your dad said anybody that eats before we win, they're going to be put to death. Catch what Jonathan's response is. Verse 30. How much better it would have been if the men had eaten today some of the plunder they took from their enemies. Like, if we'd, have, if we'd have been able to eat as we go and continue to regain, replenish our strength, would not the slaughter of the Philistines have been even greater? We, we would have, we could have won this so much faster. But because dad was impatient and set this rule, like, that cost us time. Things didn't go as well or as fast as it could have been. And Jonathan gets back and because the men hadn't eaten for such a long time and had been exerting so much energy, they are famished and they decide they can't wait. So they just kill some, some calves, some cows, and they have a slaughter. They have this little barbecue going on, but they don't really cook the meat till the blood's out of it. They just start chowing down because they are hungry. And they break the command of the Lord not to eat anything with blood still in it. So again, in Saul's impatience, gives this command, makes the soldiers go without food for so long that they are famished. They end up breaking the command of the Lord Finally, Saul finds out that Jonathan actually had broken his command and he's like, well, I, I've got to follow through on my word. And he's ready to kill his own son because he ate some honey during battle. And the people speak up on his behalf and say, no, 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 wait, this can't be done. So Saul pulls back, doesn't go through with it. I want to keep going. Chapter 14. Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. Saul is, or Samuel is giving Saul a reminder. You're the king, but remember, God's still the king of kings. You're the king. Yes, you are in charge. You have a rule and reign, but don't ever forget that God is the one that's over you. He says, well, what is, what is the message? He says to go and, and conquer the Amorites. Completely destroy them. Every living creature. Well, they go into battle. But again, Saul disobeys. He saves some for himself. Verse 9, But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and the lambs, everything that was good. We got rid of the bad stuff. Kept the good stuff. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. Verse 10, then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all that night. I'm going to pause there 
It doesn't have anything to do with Saul's obedience or disobedience. But there's something in our text that I think is worth addressing. It's this word regret. Particularly when we see it in connection with God. And we see this happen a handful or a couple handfuls of time from Genesis to Revelation where God says something to the effect of or it is said of God that he regretted or he repented. Some translations will even say, usually it's like the King James or the New King James, will use the word repent. Kind of this idea of change of mind or regret. When we regret something, it's like, ah, uh, if I had to do it over again, I wouldn't have done it that way. And in our finite thinking, and if we're not careful, if we approach a text like this, it might lead us to believe a couple of different things. One thing, it might lead us to think that God makes mistakes. How many of you think God makes mistakes? I hope nobody would raise their hand. But there might be some of you that are like, well, I'm not going to raise my hand, but doesn't that seem to say that that's what happened? That God's saying, oh, man, I got it wrong. I should have never, I should have never have picked Saul. What was I, what was I thinking? How many of you have ever had a what was I thinking moment? I have them all the time. What was I thinking? But God wasn't having a what was I thinking moment. God wasn't having a I made a mistake moment. Okay, so let's, let's just understand that that's not what's going on here. The other thing that it might make us think is that God couldn't foresee what was going to happen. We, we've heard the saying, hindsight is twenty twenty. So it's not really that God made a mistake, but if God could do it over again, like, oh, now I see what he's going to do. Now I see what he's the choices that he's going to make and how he won't really obey me completely. If I had it to do over again, I would pick somebody else. Is that what's going on with God? And I would suggest to you today that that is not what's going on with God. To think that that would be the case would, would have the idea that God does not know the future. But it's very clear from scripture that God does know the future. Oh, we, we even saw it in this text, right? Tomorrow you, you will meet a man that will come to you and you are to anoint him the next ruler or, or the, to be the ruler over my people. Like God knows the future. So what's going on? When God says that he regretted making King Saul, it's, it's not that God made a mistake. It's not that God just didn't know. It's just that he's sorrowful. Can, can you think of a time when you know you made the right decision, but yet you still hated it? You still didn't like it? Like, I, I know this is what I had to do. I had to do this. It was the right thing to do. It doesn't mean that I liked it. It doesn't mean that I enjoyed it. It doesn't mean that I was proud of it or that I celebrated it, but it was the right decision. It was what needed to be done. God chose who he chose. And there wasn't a, if I had to do it over again, I would choose somebody else. There wasn't a, oh, I didn't know this was going to happen. If I would have known this was going to happen, I'd choose somebody else. It was just one of those it was the choice. It was the right choice. It was my, his choice. And just their sorrow over it. And to understand that God does have those moments. It's just like, you know, I'm disappointed. Not, not because I thought it was going to be different. Just because I hurt. You can know that something's going to happen and then it happens and you're still like, wow, that hurts. That's sad to me. That brings me great sorrow. And that's what happens here. Let's keep going. Verse 13, when Samuel reached him, Saul said, the Lord bless you. <laughs> oh, Saul. Saul is such a politician. 
The Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. Liar, liar, pants on fire. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of the cattle uh, that I hear? But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings? Okay, Saul sticks to his story. No, 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 no. Like, we did everything. We completely followed your commands. We, we did everything God wanted us to do. And I'm like, yeah, but, but, but what about the sheep and the cattle? Oh, oh, oh. They, they were for sacrifices. We, we saved the best to give them to, to the Lord. Now, whether or not that was actually why they did what they did is beside the point. I don't think that's actually why they did what they did. But that's what he says. It was to sacrifice. And so we see Samuel's response. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. So the last thing that I want to share with you this morning. You can't use a different key. If you're trying to get God's blessing, if you want what God has for you, there isn't another key. Obedience is the only option. If you want what God has for you, obedience is the only key. There are good things that you can do. But they don't open the door for what God has for you. Unless it's an act of obedience. You can give all you want to the Lord. And that would be awesome. You can put as big of a check in the offering plate as you want to. I'll thank you for it. But if you're being disobedient to the Lord in one form or another, it still won't unlock the door for what God has for you. You, you can do all the acts of kindness in the world. But if you're not obeying the Lord by respecting and honoring and loving your spouse at home, it's not going to unlock the door that God has for you. Obedience is the key that unlocks what God has for you. So the question today is will you be obedient? Will you be obedient in the blah? Knowing that obedience in the blah will lead to God's blessing. It's not always fun. It's not always easy. It's not always rewarding. It can be a lot of barrenness in it. But to stay with it and say, I'm going to be obedient. This is where God has me. This is what God's told me to do. I'm going to keep plugging along. I'm going to keep walking in obedience. And instead of getting impatient and letting your impatience lead you to, to disobedience, to say, okay, I'm going to trust the Lord. I don't know why it's taking so long. But he said, wait. He said, don't do this until this time. I'm going to wait. And to understand that Saul did something that he wasn't supposed to do is also important to keep in mind. There's never the right time to do the wrong thing. I I'm going to say that again because I think some of you need to hear this. There's never the right time to do the wrong thing. If it's wrong, it's wrong. If it's disobedient to the Lord, it's disobedient to the Lord. But Saul thought, well, wait, wow, you know, it, I'm up against it. God will be okay with it. And like, no, it's disobedient. So let me just ask you, as the praise team comes and makes their way forward and as our ushers make their way forward, I've been pretty generic, pretty general in, in our time together this morning talked pretty broadly about obedience and disobedience. Doing so because and trusting that the Holy Spirit is faithful and able to zero in 
on what you need to hear. Whether it's encouragement to continue to be faithful in chasing donkeys, to be more patient, or maybe you understand there's an area that you've been walking in disobedience and you're just going to come to the Lord and say, God, I'm sorry. I've not been obeying you in this. I'm going to obey you from this day forward. Here's what I'm going to do. And you know exactly what needs to take place. And so if you would respond as God leads. Father, thank you Lord for this day. Thank you for your word. God, I pray that you would encourage those that maybe just have found themselves chasing donkeys lately. Would you encourage them, strengthen them. Give them the help that's needed to, to keep moving forward. To keep trusting you. Looking to you to see what you have for them. Maybe the, a divine appointment that's right around the corner. Any areas of disobedience, Lord, in our lives, help us to turn from those. Help us to not act like we're better than that. Like we don't have to really answer for that. Whether it's pride or people pleasing that seem to catch Saul. Whatever the case would be, Lord, that we would just turn that to you and come clean and turn the page and go a different direction and walk in obedience. And then, Father, I pray that as we receive these morning, this morning's tithes and offerings that you would bless both the gift and the giver for your kingdom and for your glory. We pray and we ask, may you receive the praise.